my talk cat to any i plus data for the my open source summit cat in america we are speaking about the prime machine learning at scale with principal center and kubernetes again we are speaking to you which now you can pair it up with kubernetes uh, to deploy machine learning at scale uh, about me uh, hello uh, uh, i'm a high school student and um, I've, and I've, I've been working particularly with machine learning, especially computer vision, and I've contributed to multiple projects, including but not limited to TensorFlow, Kubernetes, and more. Um, and you'll often find me working on uh, some cool open source projects or contributing to some open source projects. So that's about me, and uh, let's get on, get on with the topic. And uh, today we'll be talking about making machine learning deployments. Uh, because the truth is most models don't get deployed. Uh, and this might be due to multiple scenarios. Uh, we'll not be covering all of them today, but a lot of models don't get deployed. Um, and uh, well, if you, if you put numbers into this, well, it, as it turns out, 90% of models don't get deployed. A huge chunk of this is also uh, due to machine learning just being an iterative field. So you, you probably need to try multiple times uh, but a lot of uh, this number also comes from uh, not having uh, consistent ways uh, or uh, or there being multiple hurdles uh, while deployments. A prime uh, a prime example to uh, prove prove that point is this image, uh, and this image actually shows that uh, a part of the modeling code uh, that is all the code you write to create and train a model. There is a lot more that goes into uh, properly deploying a machine learning model and uh, so, sometimes uh, uh, all of this uh, things uh, is harder to do or is more time consuming than writing the model training code or training the model itself and this uh, diagram is actually an app representation uh, there are multiple steps uh, you need to do uh, in order to deploy a model and modeling code is just a tiny part of it as you can see the highlighted um, the highlighted square in the middle. So modeling code is just a tiny part of it. A, a really big part is the model serving or, uh, or the serving infrastructure part, uh, which is particularly what we'll be seeing today, how you can um, easily uh, have serving infrastructure up, scale it as required. And what does it mean to have a serving infrastructure? What all do you need in a, a proper serving infrastructure. So that is what we'll be talking about today. So uh, the first uh, uh, question I uh, care to answer is uh, uh, why you should care about machine learning deployments. Or uh, uh, well, um, there are a lot more tasks at hand, uh, which are probably not there when you are just training your model. Um, and we'll take a look at some of those tasks right now. Uh, what do you need to actually make a deployment? And why is this process so different from, let's say all the other parts, collecting the data for a model, training the, training the model, and why you can't probably have, let's say uh, you do the experimentation in a Jupyter notebook for a machine learning model. So why can't you have a Jupyter notebook out there for deployment? So I uh, will talk about uh, all of this right now. Uh, so with that, uh, we want to first talk about what all things to take care of or what all things you actually need to make a successful deployment. And the first thing you actually need to do is being able to package the model. And what this means is you ideally don't want to have a Jupyter notebook out there uh, or where, or where you do the deployment. Uh, but uh, what you want to do is export the model in a way that is in, way, in a way that the model is optimized. Uh, it's and you can make and you can make predictions from it. The users can use the model. So um, the first thing is, of course, we need to package our model in a way the users can use it. Probably not just uh, some directories of experiments, of course. And uh, next up, what we need to do is host the model on a server. Uh, so we want uh, we want users, let's say an Android user or, an, or someone might be calling our model from an Android application or uh, from uh, or from a web 
or, or from a website or wherever they want. So we should have an API and host the model on a server. Uh, once you host the model in a server, uh, then comes the part of, well, the server. Uh, and among a ton of things, among a ton of things uh, that needs to be done uh, to properly maintain the server, uh, a few of them are actually auto-scaling. Uh, so you need to, if you suddenly end up having a ton of users, then you need to be able to scale your compute. Uh, you need to be able to serve all of those users. Uh, your model should be able to run for all of those users. You also need to ensure global availability. Uh, you should uh, you, you should be able to serve your model easily uh, to requests being made from any part. And uh, you should do this with little bit of uh, with as less latency as possible. And uh, these are just some of the problems uh, you face while maintaining the server. And there are a ton, a ton more. But just to give you an highlight of uh, what all things you actually need to make a successful deployment and why it is so much different uh, from just training the model. So uh, now that you have hosted your model on a server, you also need a consistent API uh, to get predictions from it. So uh, in this, we'll actually talk about, uh, uh, so when I said deploying our models with the FX, and Kubernetes, I actually meant uh, a deployment. In, uh, so what your end goal is, you want to have an API and that API uh, can be used to get predictions uh, from a model and the model would probably be running on a server. So not, not running the model on device on the client side or something like that. Uh, those are also their own kind of deployments. And um, actually yesterday at uh, Open Source Summit Latin America, I gave a talk about making edge deployments as well. But uh, this talk is not about that, running the model on device. Uh, and well, that's a nice use case, but uh, a lot of the use cases are also about uh, running the model on a server and just using an API uh, to get predictions from the model. That is what we'll be talking about today. So uh, we want to do that. Uh, so we want to have a consistent API to get the predictions from the model and be able to use the model virtually anywhere. Uh, you, uh, you also need to do model versioning uh, because as we talked about, uh, machine learning is a quite iterative process. And uh, let's say tomorrow you get feedback from your uh, a feedback from the devices you run the machine uh, on the devices from where you call your machine learning model. Uh, and you may need to retrain the model a bit or you may need to uh, ch change the distribution of the data the model is trained on. Uh, or, so, or something, you might need to change the model. Um, so having consistent model versioning is also of prime importance. And finally, uh, among the multiple things, we also want to be able to do batch predictions. Uh, and this is also uh, like some of the other, it's also something very uh, specific to machine learning applications. So what batch predictions means is uh, essentially executing multiple requests together. And we'll take a better look at batch predictions and how you can do them. But um, they are especially useful um, if you want to conserve your, uh, if you want to conserve your hardware, if you want to use your hardware resources uh, in the best way possible. So we also want to be able to do batch predictions with the API. So there are actually a lot of things you need to take care of while deploying a model. And these were just the, uh, uh, these are just some of the main things uh, that you need to take care of the model. And there might actually be a ton more, which we'll also take a look at in some time. Uh, but these are some of the uh, main things you need to take care of while deploying a model. And it's actually quite, uh, and it actually seems quite a lot of work. Uh, is it quite a lot of work? Uh, well, that we'll see. We'll also see a demo of making a deployment with all of this uh, uh, in, in in place so you can support all of this uh, and making a machine learning deployment. But uh, before I actually uh, talk about how you can do this, uh, I want to uh, uh, I want to go over simple deployments and um, also talk a bit about why they become inefficient for let's say larger models or when you get a lot, a lot of users or you get a lot of model versions, why do simple deployments become inefficient? So 
first of what do I mean by simple deployments? Uh, it could be something as simple as Flask, uh, using Flask to deploy a model. And here, what I actually do is uh, uh, I have a Flask application and um, I, I, a lot of functions are not written over here. Uh, this is just a highlight of the classify function, which will do the actual prediction. But you need, uh, and this assumes that you have written, you have written down a pre-processing function and all of that, just a complete uh, code, just some complete code out there uh, and not complete code of course. Uh, but this is a very simple Flask application uh, that, uh, uh, so uh, that has a route called uh, slash classify. It takes a post request, uh, it gets all the data and um, whatever the model sends as an output. So it runs the model on it whatever the model sends as an output, it simply puts that out in JSON. And, uh, oh, well, there are, uh, and this is what I'd say as a simple deployment. And well, there are multiple caveats with this. Uh, uh, first, uh, first, of course, is you have no consistent APIs. So let's say tomorrow, if you wanted to uh, create an API route in a completely different and inconsistent manner, there is nothing stopping you from doing so. You, uh, you could have an API route, which is completely different from uh, the rest of uh, from the rest of your routes. Um, there is no consistent API for this. Also, this does not support model versioning. You will probably have to manage model versioning manually, which is a ton of pain, or use some other tools with this. Uh, uh, this does not support model versioning, or also having to do something like, uh, uh, let's say a new version of the model is out, but some users might just want to use a previous version. Uh, so support for things like this and efficient model versioning, auto pulling the model uh, from, uh, let's say a GCP bucket or an uh, Amazon S3 bucket. Uh, so things like that are also uh, not, uh, there is no support for model versioning. Uh, also, uh, we do not have mini batching support. Um, well, in a sense, you could uh, manually write down uh, mini batching code, uh, and not only would that be, uh, not only with this kind of deployment would that be inefficient, but a ton of work as well. Uh, I've actually never tried uh, mini batching in a Flask application, uh, but uh, also this does not support mini batching. Uh, and as uh, and needless to say, this is actually quite inefficient uh, if you have a large model. So. Uh, so this was an uh, example of simple deployments and why often they do not, uh, often why they are inefficient for larger models or when you have, uh, or when you have a lot of requests coming in. Uh, what we want to talk about is uh, how you can get over this. So uh, how to, how you can deploy a model without worrying about uh, how, having accounted for all of the things we mentioned earlier. Uh, so with that, we come to TensorFlow Serving uh, and I'll introduce you to TensorFlow Serving in this talk and we'll, and we'll also see a demo of it later. But uh, TensorFlow Serving is a part of, Tensor, of the TensorFlow Extended Ecosystem. So the TensorFlow Extended Ecosystem uh, allows you to deploy models and uh, do all the deployment related processes uh, very easily. So uh, um, a core part of that is actually TensorFlow Serving, uh, which allows you to do the serving part or handling the APIs, uh, managing all that goes on with the APIs uh, and uh, do, uh, do that part, the serving, uh, the model serving part uh, very easily. So uh, TensorFlow Serving could actually help us. Uh, also, yeah. So the TensorFlow Extended Ecosystem uh, is actually used internally at Google for their products as well. And uh, as, as I was saying earlier, this actually uh, TensorFlow Serving plus Kubernetes uh, actually makes our deployment a lot easier, especially when TensorFlow Serving is paired with Kubernetes. So you could also uh, get around many of the common, uh, so you could easily approach many of the common problems that deployments face, auto scaling, uh, latency, uh, getting services, managing services, uh, managing load balancers and all of these, uh, you could uh, easily do that with Kubernetes and manage them with Kubernetes. Uh, I would assume a lot of you might have already tried out Kubernetes and uh, 
and i hope uh, you might have loved uh, how how easy it makes that work so tens- so something like tensorflow serving paired with kubernetes will make your machine learning deployments uh, uh particularly very easy while also uh, giving you the benefits of uh, uh, while also you can have the benefits of tensorflow serving so that's consistent apis uh, in house support for mini batching what is working it's essentially built for machine learning deployments so you can make the best use of that so uh, oh before we go ahead uh, we'll now start talking about uh, how how you can use tensorflow serving and uh, how how you can put it in a kubernetes cluster uh, and later in the demos we'll also take a look at how you can put it in a kubernetes cluster create load balancers and uh, actually make your prediction uh, using tensorflow serving uh, so if you remember uh, what we are trying to do uh, the first part that we want to do is actually export the model or package the model uh, so what will uh, so what we'll do for tensorflow models uh, that is the example i'll be taking today but uh, you can most certainly use any other frameworks as well so uh, you can use uh, so you can use models in the onyx framework with tensorflow serving as well but uh, for for this uh, for today's talk i'll just be talking about tensorflow models the process is pretty similar and you can use most of the insights from this talk uh, uh, or or you can use most of the uh, most of the learnings from this talk uh, for your other framework deployments as well but for this uh, for this talk just for example i'll be using Uh, the example of having a tensorflow model uh, this can be anything uh, so the first thing we want to do is export our model because we ju- just don't want experiments uh, we want a model uh, which you can inference from so uh, tensorflow actually has a saved model format uh, which makes it easy to export a model and uh, this essentially takes the dynamic acyclic graph and uh, uh puts all the graph definitions as protocol buffers and it puts the graph definitions as protocol buffers uh essentially uh so uh, what the saved model directory essentially consists of is uh, uh the assets directory which contains any auxiliary files so yeah you might have vocabularies uh, uh in the assets folder uh in some cases there can also be an extra assets folder for some saved models uh, which is not loaded uh, by the graph and you can have any high level files over here uh, we also have the variables directory which as the name suggests consists of all the weights uh, for the model uh, the variables for the model uh, and finally we also have the graph definition uh, graph definitions uh, directory uh, which uh, w- which is a protocol a protocol buffer in the protocol buffer format and consists of a graph definition so uh, now now that we have packaged the model the next part would be to see how you can use tensorflow serving uh, to how, how you can use tensorflow serving to uh, deploy this model so uh, this is actually a very simple example of how you can run tensorflow serving locally uh, of course you'd want to put it in a kubernetes cluster uh, to get most of the benefits of kubernetes as well uh, to get the benefits of kubernetes as well but let's just see how you can deploy it locally so our uh, first is of course a tensorflow model server command uh, which uses uh, okay so again this is a uh, uh, this is how you do it, uh, do it locally and uh, you also have a uh, container image for this as well Uh, which uh, which we'll actually use uh, later but uh, uh, so you can deploy this locally using the tensorflow model server command and this actually works in the exact same way as the container image first so uh, uh, so first i'll just call the tensorflow model server command uh, put in the rest api port so uh, another uh, another interesting part is uh, Uh, this also supports rest apis and a grpc api side by side very easily so you could uh, so you could very easily support rest api and grpc uh, grpc side by side in a single deployment so you can also uh, add support for uh, grpc over here 
in the same way uh, you you give it a name for the model and this will also reflect in your uh, api in your api path so we talked about uh, we talked earlier about uh, there being consistent api paths so uh, your model name the model version you are using all of that actually uh, the, all of that actually represents uh, all of that actually comes in your api path and uh, the api paths or the way you would call the api would always be consistent uh, we'll also pass the model path uh, so uh, this could be a local directory or you could very well have uh, you could very well have it uh, take the model from uh, from a google gcp bucket or this could also be s3 or uh, essentially any storage so uh, yeah, yeah you could very easily grab the model from there as well this also supports polling and we'll see uh, how how it does that and how it does the model versioning part uh, a bit later but uh, uh, th this is uh, the template for a very very simple deployment uh, right now this deployment only supports rest api I just add another line to do this for grpc but this is a very simple deployment uh, and what and what this uh, already has done for us is uh, gave us consistent apis uh, we have consistent apis to call any model uh, we have the model versioning in place and we also simultaneously support uh, allows us to support grpc and rest so let's say uh, with your, your deployment if you wanted to uh, inference you could uh, very easily uh, you could very easily uh, do something like uh, uh, j just make a uh, just make a uh, post call if you are inferencing with the uh, rest api and uh, you can also specify a particular version of the model you want uh, and uh, you can also get the latest version of the model or you can pin it to a particular version of the model you wanted to run and um, as you can see over here uh the as you can see over here the uh, api urls are pretty consistent as well so we have the model name uh, which if you recall from a couple of slides ago was this simple and plain old uh, test uh, we have the port uh, so 8501 is the port where it is running the rest api we defined earlier so we have that and we also have the model version you can put in if you want to get the uh, if you want to get outputs from a particular version so this is a very simple example and um, i'm just putting in some sample data uh, it's not even well filled data but uh, uh, just some sample data and i can simply make a post request to it uh, putting in my url uh, so over here in this example what i'm doing is i'm getting the inference from the latest model version not pinning it to a particular model version yeah but as i showed with uh, in the earlier slide you can also do that so I just start to show an example for getting the latest model version. And uh, then you can very simply uh, make a push request. Uh, so that's how simple it is inferencing with rest. And uh, uh, that was uh, and that was about a very simple deployment. So I talked about also being able to inference with GRPC, uh, which is uh, which is also which is also supported right out of the box with TensorFlow serving. And we'll also see an example of this in the demos later. But uh, gRPC essentially allows you to have better connections since you are, uh, and, it's all, and it's also faster since your data is actually converted to protocol buffers. And um, all, all your request types have a designated type. Uh, so, and you'd also use gRPC stubs. So under the hood, how this works is uh, all of your data is converted into our tf example records and um, uh, that is then sent to the server uh, those already have a specific types designated and um, another interesting thing you could pair this up with although that is a bit out of the scope for this talk but another interesting thing you could pair this up with uh, is tensorflow transform uh, which also allows you to do the pre-processing steps on the server that is also part of the tensorflow extended ecosystem but we will not talk a bit, lot about that since that's outside the scope for this talk but it's pretty interesting uh, you could also pair up tensorflow transform uh, with this uh, but uh, 
you write out of the box get multiple benefits with the grpc apis and uh, you can also use this so uh, another thing we want to make sure is uh, again some of the machine learning specific uh, parts of the deployment uh, something useful just for machine learning deployments so uh, you also have an api uh, api to get the meta information and what this means is uh, so usually you have a model meta information which contains the signatures of the model that tells you how to how you can provide input to the model or get outputs from the model uh, what what would be uh, the types of inputs exp expected by the model and so on so this is particularly can be particularly useful for model tracking and elementary systems or you can also uh, use it just to understand what kind of uh, inputs and outputs the server uh, expects so you also have a model uh, meta api and um, uh, you can simply send uh, and you can simply send a request to slash metadata uh, to do this uh, So you can simply send a request to slash metadata uh, to get all the model meta information as well. So next up, we want to talk about batch inference uh, and how TensorFlow Serving also supports batch inference. So batch inference, uh, as I was talking about, uh, it uh, the idea is to simply take multiple requests and process them together. So uh, this would also allow you to use your hardware efficiently, especially if you have some hardware accelerators and also allows you to save your costs and compute resources. So uh, this is a sense, uh, this is especially uh, really useful uh, uh, if you are uh, using large models. Uh, if you have larger models, uh, batch inferences are particularly uh, really helpful for that as well. So, uh, if you want to add, uh, so if you want to add batch inference, it's also highly customizable for TensorFlow Serving. Uh, you can have multiple. Uh, you can have multiple. Um, you, you can have multiple uh, parameters uh, which can be configured with TensorFlow Serving, including what what the uh, maximum batch size would be, the number of threads, uh, the uh, the number of batch threads uh, you would be using, and so on. So uh, batch inference is actually highly uh, customizable with TensorFlow Serving, and you can uh, put these simply in the in a batch uh, in a batch config and give it to and give it to the TensorFlow model server. So you uh, you would uh, simply load the configuration file for the batch inference on the startup, and uh, of course you can like. Uh, change any change any parameter you want to change according to your own use cases so uh, batch inference is also supported right out of the box with TensorFlow serving and uh, yeah, on the right is a very simple example of how you can support batch inferencing using the parameters we defined in the last slide so uh, with that uh, i come to the uh, so with that i come to the end of my talk and uh, thank you so much for So what you can also do is not just batch inference, but uh, uh, let's say with the parameters, you also wanted to do something like uh, a request uh, a re request to get a model from a GCP bucket or S3 bucket or uh, wherever your uh, models are. So you could also pull you could also pull the buckets, and uh, that is also pretty customizable with these parameters. So you could let's say uh, check for a new version uh, in your bucket every 10 seconds for example and uh, also uh, have and also deploy the new version of the model very easily and since we already saw how model version how well model versioning is supported and how consistent it is uh, this is also particularly easy and you can do customize it with the parameters um, in a similar way uh, like we did over here so next we'll take a look at some demos uh, so on to the demos so now we'll be seeing a quick demo of uh, running tensorflow serving on kubernetes 
and uh, we'll also see how you can uh, do influence with it, do auto scaling, and essentially, uh, I'll show you uh, an example of auto scaling and uh, getting predictions from it, and then you can manage your uh, TensorFlow scaling up with Kubernetes and um, especially get a lot of the benefits related to deploying a machine learning model, uh, which we talked about earlier, uh, very easily uh, with Kubernetes. So right now, what I have uh, is uh, essentially I have already created a uh, already created a Kubernetes cluster for you. So this is like the Kubernetes cluster I've created. Right now it's on uh, EKS, that is Azure Kubernetes Services. But it could be like literally anywhere. You could uh, also probably um, try out this demo on your uh, local system using something like Minikube or even kind uh, to make local Kubernetes clusters. Uh, so yeah, you can essentially try this out anywhere. I, I've actually deployed it on Azure Kubernetes services. And uh, for this example, uh, what I already have in my Kubernetes cluster, I actually created it beforehand recording this demo since I wanted this demo to be brief and uh, not waste time in waiting for the Kubernetes cluster to be up or the deployment to be configured. Uh, so I actually just have eight nodes in this cluster and uh, this also, uh, so right now I just have eight nodes. Uh, but we'll also uh, see if we, how we can. Uh, so with Kubernetes, you already get the benefit of being able to scale very easily. Uh, so uh, we'll also see how you can manage this app with Kubernetes and get all of those benefits right out of the box. So I already have my uh, Kubernetes cluster up, and uh, I'll just come back to I'll come back over here. So what I've actually done is. Um, I actually have a couple of uh, I actually have a couple of deployments over here, uh, and um, oh uh, oh sorry I just have one deployment over here I said deployments uh, so I just have uh, one deployment over here uh, uh, but I'll show you like what also this is um, I have already deployed so first up I have uh, actually put uh, put a config map put Kubernetes config map and uh, this is for our image classifier deployment. So we just want our path. Uh, so this is a very famous ResNet model we'll be deploying. So this is the model path. Uh, this is on a Google storage bucket. Uh, you could have S3, whatever you want, as we talked about earlier. Uh, so this is just, uh, uh, so these are, uh, this is just a config map, uh, which I deployed. Uh, next up, we have the real deployment. So this is actually a Kubernetes deployment. And uh, uh, what I particularly want you to see from here is, uh, so this part, uh, so this is actually the TensorFlow serving part. Uh, and uh, if you see, we actually uh, get our uh, model name, which over here is well just uh, image classifier. Uh, the model base path, this model base path is actually taken from, uh, this model base path is actually taken from PF serving minus configs. So the Google Cloud storage bucket we defined earlier. And, um, uh, and this also, uh, and this also, uh, exposes a couple of services. So we have the HTTP uh, API, which will be running on port 8501. And we'll have the gRPC API uh, with it. Uh, as we talked about uh, with TensorFlow serving, it is particularly easy to create a REST API and gRPC and gRPC endpoints uh, very easily. You can do you can do that very easily. So uh, we have the REST API running on port 8501, the gRPC API running on port 8500, and this is also explicitly requesting for one CPU and uh, two gigabytes of memory. Uh, of course, you can change this uh, according to the model size or some other factors. Uh, but right now, I just hard coded this uh, and put it. So uh, what we'll also need is uh, uh, we'll also we'll also need a load balancer. Uh, so this is a very simple load balancer, uh, which uh, uh, which also supports both 8500, which is uh, a gRPC port and port 8501 are uh, uh, are REST API port. So uh, I, I actually deployed all of all these three for you. So uh, in the same Kubernetes cluster. Uh, so we don't take a lot of time to uh, get all of these up and ready. Uh, but now that I have deployed these, so what we can actually do is uh, let's just do keep keeping the deployments. Uh, Good and good deployments. So I actually have the image classifier deployment up and running. I 
also have uh, my load balancer. So I have uh, I have my load balancer service up and running. Uh, so this is the external IP for the load balancer, which we'll be using when uh, uh, which we'll be using uh, when we are trying to uh, call the REST API or the gRPC API. So uh, so this external IP is what we'll be using. So I'll just get this. So we already have a service up. We already have a deployment up. Um, so what we can do is uh, uh, let's actually try running an example. Uh, let's try running a prediction from this. Uh, now that we have actually deployed the ResNet model. So uh, oh, so before we go any forward, I also want to uh, talk a bit about uh, uh, the model we currently have. So let's actually do that. Uh, let me come back one directory uh, and then let's just say star xvzf uh, resnet dot 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 gz. So uh, this is, oh, I shouldn't have put it out into the main directory with all the other, uh, with all the other folders here. Might make it confusing, uh, but let's fix that. Uh, shall we? So we have the variables folder out, save model.pb folder, uh, file. Okay, there it is. So now let's go into CD into ResNet and let's do an LS over here. So let's do an LS over here. And what I see is, uh, so this is the ResNet 101 model. So uh, 101 uh, in simple words is just uh, a way to measure the size of the model. Uh, and uh, so this ResNet model is actually trained on the ImageNet data set. So that's, um, uh, so that's an array. Uh, so that's, uh, so that's a data set with an array of, um, uh, with an array of uh, labels. Um, and it contains labels for uh, multiple objects. Uh, so the ImageNet 1K consists of uh, 1000 labels uh, for multiple common, common objects. So that is what this model is trained on. And if you recall, we were talking about like the package model structure, what will we actually be deploying? So this is what is actually in the uh, Google Cloud storage bucket. Uh, we have a saved model.pb file, which is our graph definition saved as protocol buffers. We also have the variables file. The variables file actually uh, shows our weights. So if I do an LS over here, uh, I only have like one weights file uh, and I have a dot index file. So let's say if this was probably a bigger model uh pro probably a lot so this model is uh, just around 110 mb but if this was probably a bigger model uh you would probably have your weights sharded as files so right now this shows uh this is uh zero of one and um I, if you would probably have a bigger model uh these weights would be sharded into multiple files um so you would essentially have your weights that way so in this uh, simple model, we actually don't have the assets or the extra assets directly which we talked about. It's just all of these. Good. So uh, for the example, what we'll actually be seeing is this image. Uh, this is a pretty famous image. Uh, even in the machine learning world, this is a pretty famous image. And we'll try to run inference on this. Well, what I have for this um, is, uh, I've actually already prepared, uh, I've actually already prepared the API content for you. So uh, if I just go to the request body, so this is the API content and uh, well, what is all of this? Uh, okay, so this is just the base 64 encoding of the image we have. So uh, so this is, uh, these are all the instances I want. So instances means how many images you want to put in. So in my case, in our case, we just have a single image. So this is our single image, and this is in the base 64 format. All of this is uh, mix up that um, image you just saw, uh, mix up that grasshopper image you just saw. So uh, so this is like what makes up the image, and uh, uh, let's actually try running a prediction uh, on this image. So I already have a command up here. So I'll just use this and make a prediction uh, on it. Okay, uh, that was pretty quick, uh, and it actually told me that uh, uh, well, this is a military uniform, uh, which is its which is the model's first guess, and it's ninety four percent sure. Um, and well, if you uh, if you remember that image, it was actually a military uniform. So the model was pretty accurate in this case, and um, 
Uh, so another simple example, and when we can essentially harness the power of Kubernetes, not just do horizontal uh, horizontal uh, auto scaling, but uh, uh, you, you can be a lot more. Uh, you can do a lot more customizations. But I'll just show a simple example, and um, uh, this is uh, actually uh, like the HPA, uh, the horizontal pod auto scaling. A very simple example of this, and all I'm saying is, uh, uh, well, uh, for this is for the image classifier deployment, and if the CPU percent is maximum, you should scale from uh, one to four, uh, minimum one or maximum four. Uh, that is all I'm saying in this uh, HPA. And this is just a simple example of an HPA. There's a lot more you can, of course, do now that you have a deployed your TF serving on a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, and will this say is it already exists? Well, yes, I deployed it. So if I just do kubernetes get HPA, I actually see uh, this is a horizontal uh, pod auto scaler. And um, this is also deployed. Um, this is also deployed. So um, this is just a simple example of. Uh, uh, so we are actually using the horizontal power of the scaler when we are making the request. And this is uh, just a very simple example of one of the many things uh, you can do now that we have managed it in a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, but that was it for the demo. Uh, so we also uh, so we saw how we can uh, deploy our model as a Kubernetes cluster, which was pretty simple. Uh, use TensorFlow serving from the TensorFlow extended ecosystem to do this. While also getting some of the benefits, uh, well, all of the benefits of Kubernetes. So that was all for the demo. So with that, I come to the end of my uh, talk at Open Source Summit Latin America, and thank you so much for hearing. Uh, feel free to reach out to me if you have any more questions or uh, or well, just anything. Uh, feel free to reach out to me uh, on Twitter at Rishit underscore Dagli. And uh, that was it for the talk. Uh, see you later. I hope to see you in person at the next Open Source Summit Latin America.